chicken offering on Wednesday nights now instead of just giving it on your way back. So there's one minor change there and uh, we're going to just receive it here at the front. So after the service, towards the end of the service, we'll receive the offering as well. Just a little bit easier to do that. There was a little bit of mix-ups happening where people were putting it in diversified plates. <laughs> so it was getting a little scattered. And so uh, it's good to scatter seed as when you plant seed, but it's hard for us to find it when you scatter it all around the church <laughs> or when it gets scattered around the church. So, so we'll do it that way. Amen. And, and uh, it's just, uh, I, I always enjoyed receiving an offering or bringing an offering anyway. I really uh, just feel like there's something special to that. I want to go to the Word tonight. We're going to be in Matthew chapter number 6. Got to be one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible, Matthew chapter number 6. I want to start tonight a teaching on the kingdom. On the kingdom. We've touched uh, in previous Bible studies a little bit about having a heart for the kingdom. And I think we did a couple messages on that that was online. But I really wanted to get into what it means, the kingdom. To try and get a better understanding of what it is we're talking about when we see the kingdom. One of the things that Jesus talked the most about was the kingdom. And yet I think that very few Christians have understanding of what that really means when we talk about the kingdom or when Jesus would teach that. And he would talk about the kingdom. But it is such an essential topic, such a vital point for us to have understanding, because God wants us to be kingdom people. He wants us to have a heart for his kingdom. He wants us to be kingdom-minded so that we are considerate of what is the will of the king. What is the will of the king? What the Lord has called us into as Christians is a kingdom. A lot of people think that Christianity is a religion. But we're called into a kingdom. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. It is not a republic. And it is not a religion. It is a kingdom, and it has a king. And so there's so many points where Jesus taught on the kingdom. Here in Matthew 6, it deals a great amount with Jesus teaching us about the kingdom. And we're going to start off reading here. I think I'll go King James because we have that on the overhead. We don't? It's not working. Okay. Amen. How many have your Bible with you tonight? How many have a Bible app? Amen. <laughs> Bible apps count, and, and they're great for a go-to, if nothing else. Amen for a backup. Matthew 6, and we'll start off in the ninth verse. I did touch a little bit about this on Sunday when I mentioned the Lord's Prayer and how he taught us how to pray, but in the Lord's Prayer where he teaches us to pray, remember we call it his prayer, but he's teaching us to pray, and he says, when you pray, when you pray, After this manner, pray ye, in the ninth verse, Matthew 6, after this manner, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever. Amen. He goes on to talk about forgiveness there, saying that if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You can see that that word kingdom is mentioned 
several times in the prayer that he has taught us how to pray or the way that he has taught us to be prayerful, praying for his kingdom to come, his will to be done, where our attention and our focus is towards the king and our prayer is to implement what is the will of the king, that the will of the king would be done on earth, that his kingdom would come, that his kingdom would manifest in our lives, that his kingdom would manifest in our towns, that his kingdom would manifest on the earth. The Lord God is the king of kings, the king of glory. I believe there's a verse that he's referred to as the ancient king. The ancient, the ancient king. He is a king, and he has a kingdom. You know, we don't understand a lot about kingdom today because we weren't born into a kingdom. Naturally speaking, the concept of a kingdom is very foreign to us. I guess we would consider Canada mostly a democracy with some attachments to a monarchy. The United States is a republic. We know, we know a lot about religion. Religion is, you know, leads to systems and gives us a list of do's and don'ts. But the kingdom wants to overtake our life in such a way where we're not just living a system, we're living our new nature as kingdom people. Or that we no longer have the culture that we used to have trying to live by a list, but that that list or those laws of the Old Testament are now written in our minds and in our hearts so that it has changed our culture. And we're living it inside out because there has been change within us. A born again experience. Born of another kingdom. Born belonging to another country now. No longer just a citizen of Canada, though naturally speaking we still have that disposition, but a citizen of the kingdom of God. If we understand that his kingdom, though not seen physically, is still exactly that, a kingdom it operates as a kingdom does with principles. It has its own culture. It is the culture of heaven. And the culture of heaven wants to invade our lives. There's a great teacher on the kingdom who's gone to be with the Lord now. His name was Miles Monroe. He really teach, taught a very unique perspective on the kingdom, wrote many books about it. I'm just going to read you one of his statements here. He says, a kingdom is not a democracy, a religion, or a republic. A kingdom is a governing influence of a king over his territory, impacting it with his will, his purpose, and his intent, producing a citizenry of people who express his culture and reflect his nature. You see, a kingdom is all about the king. A kingdom is governed by the word of the king. Subject to the king's thought. The intentions of the king. And so the citizens of the kingdom, they live by the word of the king. That is their government. They live by the word of the king. That, that, that is now what they follow. That is now what they adhere to because that's the kingdom that they belong to. And they are under the influence of the king. They seek the king. Their whole lives are affected by the presence of the king. By the things that the king does. By the intentions of the king. By the king's values. By spending time with the king or under the banner of the kingdom. 
spending time in the presence of the king by being under his banner, we begin to learn and take on what is the king's values. And so Jesus, where he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, the kingdom provokes us to surrender our own ways. Separate ourselves from principles that maybe we used to live by, but now those principles conflict with this kingdom that I have now become a citizen of. I would like to add that we are not just just citizens of the kingdom, but children of the kingdom. Hallelujah. That we have become a part of his lineage, a royal people, a, royal gen a chosen generation, a peculiar people, Peter talked about. And how he's made us to be kings also. There's kings in the earth, but Jesus is king of kings. King of kings. When God made the earth, he was advancing his kingdom. When God made the earth and put the first men in it, he was advancing his kingdom. Every kingdom wants to advance, to take more territory. When God made Adam and Eve, and in that garden, he placed them, creating the garden that was perfect. He was advancing his kingdom. But Satan came in, and men rebelled against the king. And so the king had to separate men from the garden, because men's heart had become corrupted with another system. With a fallen angel, Lucifer, who was establishing a counterfeit kingdom. A counterfeit kingdom. And the Bible has referred to Satan as the God of this world. Not that he is the creator of this world but he is the God of a system in this world where he is trying to establish his counterfeit kingdom, a perverted kingdom that tries to tell men they don't need the king because he desires to rule over the hearts and, men's, and minds of men, to corrupt and pervert the creation that God had made and he blessed Adam in that garden and told Adam, be fruitful and multiply. Expand the territory. Expand the territory. Cause this garden of perfection to go forth. Let the blessing that is upon you expand. Take what you got and multiply it. God blessed him. He put on the inside of man or that, that, that empowerment that he could advance the will of God in the earth. Of course, Satan, in his subtlety, his deception, he caused separation between man and God. And Jesus Christ stepped in to breach the divide and the separation. The king of kings, amen, put on flesh like that of a man. God manifest in the flesh, amen, humbling himself. Humbling himself and taking on the disposition of a man. Leaving the splendors of heaven. Manifesting in a lowly manger, though he was the glorified king and the king of kings. When Jesus was tempted of the devil in the wilderness, the Bible tells us that one of the things that Satan offered him, he said, throw yourself down. He 
He gave him a, a proposal to say that all the kingdoms and all the glory of them, all of its splendor, I will give to you. But Jesus didn't debate the devil and say, you don't have any power to give me anything. Because the enemy, he had his kingdom. I think that shows us a lot today even. The way that Satan works and operates. How he controls. Controls countries. Controls kingdoms. This is one of the things I, I think I taught a lot about to try and show that there is a kingdom of light working, a kingdom of darkness. Both of these things are at work in the earth. Amen? Both of them. And then us here, we're, we're to be citizens of the light, citizens of the kingdom, obstructing the agenda of darkness. Amen? Obstructing the agenda of that fallen angel, Lucifer, who had tried to assert God but was brought low. And still today he is trying to assert the church. He's trying to lift himself up in lofty places. But we, being kingdom people, amen, are still wanting to advance the will of God in the earth. To bring in as many souls as we can, amen, to the kingdom of God. Snatching them from the clutches of the enemy. Snatching them from the flames of hell. And bringing them in into Jesus Christ with the message of the gospel. How he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. So Satan, he offered Jesus kingdoms, natural kingdoms. In one place, Jesus said that his kingdom was not of this earth. That he was of another kingdom. I have it here. It's John 18, 36, where Jesus answered and said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should, be, that I should not be li- delivered to the Jews. This is when Jesus is addressing Pontius Pilate before he is crucified, after the Jews have taken him, But Jesus says, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, thou says that I am a king, and to this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. And everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Hallelujah. I want to get back into Matthew 6 here a little bit more as as we just keep on reading. I think this is the 19th verse. The way I kind of got it taken down here, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but where it starts off reading and it says, no man can serve two masters. Is that the 19th verse? Anyone following? That's not 19? What verse am I in then? 24, okay. Okay. Oh yeah, 24, I see that. Is 19 lay not up for yourselves? Yeah. I could just open the Bible here beside me, but I'm trying to follow my notes. (laughs) Okay, well let's go. Let's go there first then. To Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is a powerful principle of the kingdom here and goes against that which is our flesh in probably every way possible where he's saying don't invest in everything that is carnal that's just going to wither away, dry up, and be burnt up. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Be a kingdom-minded person that is laying up for themselves rewards over there. Amen. Are you mindful of your heavenly rewards? Do you live your life in any way, shape, or form that reflects that? That you are living your life out of that intention that there is reward over there for me. 
I may sacrifice here and have to sow here time and time again, but over there is my reward. Now, I do believe today that God blesses us in this life, and, and, and when we sow, we also reap in this life. The scripture said something about when we forsake father and mother for him, and uh, I haven't read them in a while, but it, uh, it went on to say that we would receive a greater reward in this life, but also in the next. That the things that we're willing to leave, the things that we're willing to let go of, he's going to bless us, not only in this life, but also in the next, hallelujah, where you are investing in his kingdom, your heart is his kingdom. Kingdom culture is taking you over, and you are more mindful about a kingdom that you can't see than the one that you can see because you know that the kingdom of God is more real. Amen? It's more real than even the one you see with your physical eye because his kingdom is eternal. His kingdom is eternal. It is uncompromising, unwavering. It, 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 it will never be, he will never be dethroned. So as we talk about the kingdom, the kingdom is all about the king. The king's will, the king's intention, the king's heart, the king's values. Trusting in the king. Loving the king. Serving the king. Doing the king's bidding. Advancing the king's dumb, the kingdom, advancing the kingdom of the king, spreading out his will, preaching his message, preaching his word, his gospel, that which is of the kingdom. We're called to obey the king. Someone say, obey the king. And so this is where it says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That word mammon is talking about money. I'd say not just money, but that whole system that revolves around it. You cannot both be in service to God and in service of money. You can't live for God and live for money at the same time. That worldly system. That system that teaches you to trust in yourself and to trust in men. But God is absent. God is absent. Many people, they trust in that system. They trust in the economy. But what happens when the economy goes bad? Well, what happens to Wall Street investors when they lose everything? Many of them start, you know, looking for the closest bridge and and all of this kind of destruction that begins to follow the aftermath when the kingdom that you trusted in has just lost its value. But as citizens of God's kingdom, our trust is not to be in the economy of men, but the economy of God. Where God is our ultimate source. And the resources that I need, I draw from that which is my source. I trust in Him. I serve Him. I don't serve money. I don't live for money. And I have a provider. The King looks after me. But He calls me to trust in Him. To trust in Him. To believe in Him. To follow Him. And yes, of course we know God calls us into the marketplace. But we are not of that system. We might operate within the systems of the world, but we are of another system or another kingdom, which is a better because the kingdom is not just a system. Trusting in God or trusting in money? Trusting in things eternal or trusting in things that are going to burn up and perish? And Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Well, that's what life teaches us to think about, to be mindful of. What am I going to eat? What am I going to think about? 
What, are, what am I going to put on? You know, these are, these are pretty big things in our life. Some people, that's the extent of their living. What am I going to eat? What am I going to put on? What are, you know, that's, that's pretty much the, the, their whole passion. <laughs> but to not be consumed with those things. Because our Heavenly Father knows what we already need. But rather to be mindful having our values on the king where we trust in him to take care of us. This is a dependency that is honorable. I have a faith and a trust in the king. I live by faith. I trust in him so that when other resources have run dry, I know that the king and his kingdom is still intact, just like it always was. This, might be, this message might become a whole lot more valuable to us as days go on. Because I don't know what kind of shape the world's going to be in. I see a whole lot of crazy things going on. Amen? A whole lot of crazy things going on. I'm glad to know today that my king is still on his throne. That I have a king who has a kingdom. And in that kingdom, I have protection. And in that kingdom, I have peace. And in that kingdom, I have security. My security doesn't depend on the world. My security is in Jesus. And so when we start to see some of those things eroding and some of those things dissolving around us, that much more we need to be looking to the king and saying, Jesus, you are the security that I need in this life. You are my ultimate security. Lord, I look unto you. You are my peace. You are my provision. You are my hope in this life. So that we don't have to be consumed when things start going around, uh, wrong around us because we're looking up unto the king. Don't take thought for your body. What you will put on is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add a cubit under his stature, and why do you take thought for your raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Take therefore no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. First. Someone say first. First. You see, it's not that he's teaching us to not, and I've tried to, you know, always break this verse down like that, that where we talk about that, where he's not teaching us to, to live our lives uh, carelessly in the sense that, that we have no management and have no planning and, and are not being good stewards, but careless in the sense where we are casting the weight off, the care, the pressure, the how, how am I going to survive? How, how am I going to do it? You put that off on him. Keep your priorities straight where he's teaching us that our duty, the number one thing that we have to be thinking about, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. How many times has our mind been filled with the worries of life and what happens? It takes away from our attention being on his kingdom. And we're going to self-preservation mode. We try and brainstorm and figure out how we're going to survive and how we're going to do it. We're all prone to these things, all of us. But it's when you get to those places where you don't know what to do. And all the planning in the world doesn't seem to be able to make something work. 
which I've been to some of those places in the last little while, and had to trust God, not knowing what he was going to do, but just trust him that he's going to do something. Amen? I love the way Dave explained it to me when it looked like we were going to be without a home. And he said, I went over the numbers and I looked at everything and there was no way you were going to get a place in time. (laughs) He said, he's preparing the apartment above his shop. We're getting ready to because he knows we're not going to have a place. Doesn't make sense. I didn't know what we were going to do. But God was faithful. (laughs) And in all this year and plus, never been a, without a roof over my head. Amen? God uses different avenues. He uses people like Tim and Megan who will say, we have a place. Amen? God uses people. God uses things. God has many ways of getting us to where he wants us to be. But when it comes down to our lives, are we trusting in Him? Are we seeking Him first? Because when we're not, we get our eyes on all of those other things and we end up going off course of what is the will of our King, living for other things, trying to make our flesh comfortable, just trying to sustain ourselves. Instead of walking by faith and trusting in Him, Some of the principles of this kingdom. God's ways of doing things are upside down or downside up, however you want to look at it. From what is the normal way where we would normally do things? For example, the kingdom teaches us to be givers. And God taught us that if we give, it would be given. This is Luke 6, 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Well, many people, when they need something, don't think about giving. Amen? I have a need. So I need to get more. And yet the kingdom will teach us to give away. Teaches us to be giving people. God calls us to be givers. All of us. Amen. Not just certain people in the congregation. All of us to be givers. You might not be able to give on the same level as somebody else. You may not be able to give in the same way as somebody else. You might not be able to give money all the time. But it doesn't mean you can't give something where God calls us to be givers and contributors, to give, and it shall be given. And God will certainly, at times in our life, lead us to give, lead us to give. When we were waiting to sell our house in Kamsack and prayed so much, uh, you know, intensely about that sale and it didn't seem to come until we just decided we were going to have to go anyway, one of the things we did was I, I, I started thinking about sowing. I got to sow a seed. I need to sow a seed. Not that I'm trying to buy a miracle. And, and, and we, gotta confu- don't, we, we don't want to confuse that. Because you can't buy a miracle from God. This isn't a, a, a transaction in the sense that, you know, you, I'll give you this if you give me that, you know. But it's a, a, a principle of faith and sowing. And sowing where you do have the understanding that if I give, he gives back. But I'm not trying to purchase something from him. Like, I need a sale, God, so I'll give you 10 bucks. You give me a sale? 50 bucks. $500, Lord, you give me a sale. I'll give you 600. No, six, 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 seven, eight, 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 eight. No, 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 you know, back and forth with the Lord. Negotiation. No, you're sowing, you're sowing. And I believe that the principle of tithing, which I plan to start teaching on in, in some of our Sunday services going forward, is such a powerful principle in our lives 
Because it teaches us to honor God first and not with what's left over. To honor Him and respond to Him in faith and obedience instead of trying to take care of ourselves and then if we have anything that's still left at the end of the day, we consider giving something over to the Lord. But He calls us to be givers. To sow into his kingdom. He gives more to us so that we can give more. Amen. I don't believe that the intention of the king is just to make us all fat and sassy with riches and blessings. Where we're all sitting on our yachts and flying our private jets and don't have time to preach to anybody because we're too busy enjoying the, the blue waters and all of the sunshine. But I do believe that God blesses his people. He blesses us. He wants to eat, he delights in blessing us. Giving us good things. And we're to rejoice with people that are prospering. Whether that's financially, you know, if somebody is prospering financially, we should be right there rejoicing with them. Amen? Somebody got a new truck, you know, you don't want to be all, why don't I get a new truck? They didn't even give me their old truck. (laughs) But rejoice. My brother got a blessing. Amen. And we rejoice with one another. He blesses us that we can be blessings in the earth. He gives to us so that we can be givers. And teaches us to give. Saying it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Amen. He multiplies. Hallelujah. He multiplies, and that's why he calls us to sow, not buy a miracle, sow a seed. Sow a seed. Respond to the Lord. Honor him. Show him that you obey him first, that you seek his kingdom. You're here seeking his interests and not your own. What is the interest of the king? I want his kingdom to come. I want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we have that kind of heart, we sow into the work of the Lord, the local church. We're able to send missionaries. We're able to do things. Why? Because we want his kingdom to come. We want his will to be done. We want souls to be saved. We want the captives to be freed. And so giving is a reverse concept to the flesh, but it's a principle of a kingdom that now we are a part of. And he says to us, give and it shall be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall they give into your bosom? For what what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Meaning if you sow little, you'll reap little. But if you sow much, you'll sow much. Or you'll reap much, excuse me. God calls us all to be givers. It doesn't mean that you're the bank of whatever your name is. <laughs> and so every time your kid asks for 20 bucks, you're obligated to say yes. <laughs> I shared with somebody one day how somebody asked me for help. And I really feel like God told me no. God told me no. Even though my heart and first reaction intention was to help them. Because they were a friend who had a need. But in this particular instance, even though my intention was already to go about trying to get it done for them somehow, I felt like the Lord was telling me, no, don't do it. And so at the end of the day, all I could do is call them and tell them and felt like I just kind of, you know, given them a cop out saying, you know, I really just feel like God doesn't want me to do it. (laughs) Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, I get it. Thanks. Bye-bye. You know, it didn't go that way, but that's, you know, what you're kind of thinking when you have to tell somebody that. 
And so what the situation was is that they were buying a house and they were buying it rent to own and the way that was explained to me was the person had kind of uh, changed up the deal and if they didn't get a bunch of money quick they were going to lose everything that they invested into it. But the Lord told me it wasn't me to do it. And I think I mentioned to him a name, and that's the person that they actually ended up getting it from, but the person that they borrowed the money from also had lawyers. I didn't have lawyers. <laughs> lawyers can be a real threat to somebody that's trying to be a, what's a good word to use? Don't say it. A sidewinder? I don't think that's the right word that I'm looking for. Schemer? I don't know. <laughs> but God will also bring us opportunities to give and so when we were looking to thinking about me when I just wanted to sell my house and I'm just sharing with you some personal things today and we were looking for you know an opportunity to some place to sow a friend of ours ended up being in real need and so I think they were just telling us to pray but we were able to meet that need and meet that need for them. And so we, we sowed that there. And then we still went on by faith. So we're, we're living lives that are led of the Spirit. But God also wants us to be in positions where we're able to give. Because it's hard to give what you don't have. Right? So he wants to bless us and he wants to put something in our hands. So that we can be a blessing in the earth. That's why he wants us to live long lives and be strong and be fruitful. And, you know, he wants us to be able to go about his business. And have the heart that we're out to do as much as we can for the Lord while we're in this life. Amen. As much as we can for the Lord while we're in this life. Having a heart that has really just been taken over. I'm just going to close with this. A heart that has really been taken over by what is the culture of the kingdom. The way that is the kingdom way. God's way of doing things. And where we're seeking not our own interests, but the Father's. You know, when we th talk about culture, a lot of people have different cultures. But the way I best know to describe culture is it is the way of living that is our normal behavior. Things that have become our normal way of doing something, it's just natural to us now. It's just naturally, we naturally respond that way. We naturally do those things because that's, that's part of our culture. So you go to different parts of the world and there's things that are natural there that aren't natural here and vice versa be because of different cultures. But when we come into God's kingdom, many times we come with our own culture still, and we start trying to operate out of our old life or our old cultures instead of allowing the kingdom culture to take over our own. Because a lot of times in our culture, there was, you know, all kinds of different pagan roots and all kinds of different traditions, that, and not that all traditions are bad or anything like that, and, and I, I think it's good to be able to celebrate some of our culture but at the same time, does your culture clash with kingdom culture? Because if your culture clashes with kingdom culture, you need to lay down your kingdom and seek ye first the kingdom of God and his own righteousness and his righteousness, amen, which is walking in sync with him, in sync with the king, the will of the king. So when we talk about kingdom culture taking our lives over, you know, you think about loving people as part of the, the kingdom of God, part of the new birth culture. Forgiving people as part of our culture, as new covenant believers, amen? That's why Jesus taught us to forgive after he taught us how to pray, he taught us how to forgive. That's part of our culture. He wants it to become, that's our normal way of living, our normal way of responding, though it's completely opposite to the flesh in the way in which we used to live our lives. But now I'm a kingdom man or a kingdom woman. I'm a child of God. I'm an heir of God 
and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Why don't you stand with me tonight? I encourage you to think about some of these things that were mentioned tonight. If you took down some notes, if you want to go back and watch this over again, think about this a little bit. Think about this through this week a little bit. What does it mean to be part of his kingdom living in this earth? His kingdom that though it's not, un, it's not seen with my natural eye, it is very much real. It's living inside of me. What does it mean to be a part of this kingdom? And to be praying, my Father, your kingdom come. Your will be done. That's our prayer every day. Every day. I want your kingdom to manifest through my life. I want to be a good representative of the kingdom. I want to be a good representative of the king. I want to be doing what you called me to do, to spread your kingdom, Lord, because it's all for you and it's all for your glory. And so we're just going to close with that thought and prayer and just say, Lord Jesus, that you would settle this word in our hearts and you would give us a glimpse tonight of what that means in our lives. Places you might speak to each one of us right now. Change our hearts and change our minds anywhere, Lord, that our place of living conflicts with your kingdom where our culture conflicts with the culture of the kingdom. Cause your will to come alive on the inside of us so that we don't try to live our lives with two masters, two kings, two lords, because there is only one true Lord and one true king, and Jesus, that's you. That's you. So with this message, Lord, that I preach tonight, I just pray that you bring revelation to people and reveal to them by your spirit as only you can in Jesus' mighty name. And I pray, Lord, as a church body that we would all be people that would be of a kingdom mind, having a kingdom heart. I just pray that prayer, Lord, knowing that that prayer goes beyond what is my own understanding. But knowing that that is, Lord, where I want to be and want us to be. We want your kingdom to come, your will to be done. And we know that time is short, Lord, in this life. Time is short. Life itself is like a vapor. But that we are living in these last days, Lord, and you're coming soon. Let our lives, Lord, reflect who you are. And let us bring glory to the King. Glory to the King. Jesus, you are King. Jesus, you are Lord, and we praise you today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight.